from the Weather Channel, a special presentation. In 1989, Hurricane Hugo devastated South Carolina. But Hugo is just the latest in a long line of killer storms. Today, our coastlines are more heavily populated than ever. Now, evacuating the coast when danger threatens may no longer be possible. Two-thirds of the city, once called the New York of Texas, lay in mountains of debris. Thousands of dead were entombed within the rubble. In Galveston, Texas, we found out just how terrible a hurricane can be. I don't think that most people would have had any idea what, what uh, was in store, although the situation began to look worse and worse throughout the afternoon and by late afternoon uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, they did know that they were in for a lot of trouble. In fact a telegram was sent by the meteorologist in Galveston, Isaac Klein up to Washington saying that he thought there was going to be a large part of the city underwater and very heavy loss of life. Water did cover the entire island. The force of winds and waves splintered and broke homes apart. A tremendous line of debris was created as timber from one shattered house battered down the walls of the next and the next. The water went down pretty quickly, and what they found was something indescribably horrible. They found half of their city gone. They found 6,000 people gone. They didn't realize that at the time, although they knew that the death toll was going to be high. They had no notion of how high it would be. Most of them were simply trying to find their families, if anyone had survived, and then getting down to the business of living. The first business of living was taking care of the dead. The number of dead was overwhelming. Faced with the threat of disease, the order was given for mass burial at sea. As bodies reappeared with the tide, a quick solution had to be found. The mounds of wreckage became funeral pyres. The dead buried within the mounds were rarely counted. Today, Galveston stands protected by a seawall 17 feet high and over 10 miles long. The wall was built in response to a disaster long ago, but the threat is just as real today. Many of the hurricanes that affect the United States begin thousands of miles away. These storms are called Cape Verde type hurricanes and are born in the moist tropical air off the coast of Africa. Every three to four days, a tropical wave bends the trade winds blowing from the northeast off the Cape. In developing storms, clouds build higher and higher and the air pressure drops. The low pressure attracts warm, moist air near the ocean's surface. The rotation of the Earth causes these low-level winds to spiral in a counterclockwise direction around the center of the low. As the clouds build to enormous heights, the spiral closes in on itself, forming the hurricane's eye. A hurricane is a vast heat engine. The fuel is warm ocean water. It feeds heat and moisture into the air, being sucked into the center of the storm. Some of the incoming air rises into the spiral rain bands that surround the storm's core. As warm air reaches the eye wall, it rises rapidly and condenses into clouds and rain. The rising air releases tremendous amounts of heat into the atmosphere and creates violent winds. The hurricane's engine is constantly refeeding itself, 
concentrating its power in the wall of clouds surrounding the storm's eye. The eye wall contains the hurricane's most destructive power. One, zero, ignition, liftoff. In the 1960s, meteorology hurtled into a new age, the age of satellites. In modern times, of course, the satellite has become very important because that allows us to look all the way across the ocean and we can see any development from the very beginning. Now, when a hurricane gets close to land, we also have land-based radar. And in the United States, we're the only country that actually flies reconnaissance aircraft into hurricanes. That is the most precise information we can get. Back before we had the satellite, we had aircraft down in the Caribbean just to go out and fly these very long routes to see if a hurricane might be developing. The Weather Channel's John Hope first joined the National Hurricane Center in 1962. Pretty much for more than a quarter of a century, my work has been totally involved in tropical meteorology and, and hurricanes. We cannot predict a track quite as accurately as we would like to be able to. We are improving. If we look back over the last 25 years, we can see just a gradual improvement over that quarter of a century in our ability to forecast precisely the landfall point of a hurricane. Unfortunately, while this improvement is taking place at a rate that may look something like this on a graph, our population is going like that. So here in the state of Florida, for instance, we have 1,500 people every day that cross the border up the north coming into Florida, and the great majority of those people are on the coast. The same thing is happening essentially all around our coast from Texas all the way around through Maine. So our population is increasing at a much faster rate than our ability to forecast where the storm's going to go, and that gives us real problems in certain areas which are difficult to evacuate. Hurricanes threaten our Gulf and Atlantic regions and can also affect inland areas for miles with thunderstorms, tornadoes, flooding, and wind. If you live in these coastal regions, you can better prepare your home and family by following these hurricane safety tips. Begin by entering each hurricane season prepared. Check your supply of plywood boards, tools, batteries, and non-perishable foods. All of these items should be in your home long before the first hurricane watch is issued. Know the difference between a hurricane watch and a warning. A watch means possible danger. If the danger materializes, a hurricane warning will be issued. Once your area receives a warning, you should leave low-lying areas, protect your windows with boards or shutters, secure outdoor objects, fuel your car, save several days' water supply, usually at least three gallons for each member of your family. And when called to evacuate, do so immediately. Later in the program, safety tips on what to do during and after a hurricane. The warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico provide its coastal cities with a livelihood and a way of life. But the pleasures of golf life are tempered with a remembrance of the past. A past of hurricanes where all can be lost in one day. On Saturday, August 16, 1969, golf residents from Florida to Texas prepared for the worst. Forecasters were uncertain about what Camille might do. That was kind of in the early days of uh, our being able to interpret satellite imagery. Hurricane Camille was actually kind of small in the Gulf of Mexico as far as the area that it encompassed. And for that reason, the initial interpretations of satellite imagery said that maybe the hurricane wasn't all that strong. Well, once we got a reconnaissance aircraft in there, we found out that that wasn't the case. It was stronger than we thought it was. Yeah. 
Sunday, shortly before midnight, Camille's 180 mile per hour winds pushed a 24 and a half foot tidal surge over Mississippi's shoreline. Oh man, that's the only time in my life I was ever scared. I was really scared for my life and my family's life. Camille's destruction was widespread and complete. The homes of 74,000 families were damaged or destroyed. If you've been through Camille, You've been through a storm, a killer. Wave after wave, there's tons and tons and tons of water. It's just, just hard to comprehend what that's gonna do. They just haven't built the house yet that can stand the pressure from the water. All the ones that the water hit went down completely. Hurricane Camille destroyed $1 billion worth of coastal property. One hundred and forty-one people died along the coast. Most drowned in a flood of seawater, a phenomenon known as storm surge. As a hurricane approaches the coast, its winds drive water shoreward. Once the edge of the storm reaches the shallow waters of the continental shelf, hurricane force winds push the water onto the shore. At first, the water level climbs slowly, but as the eye approaches, water rises rapidly. Waves traveling on top of the surge hammer away at structures built on the shoreline. I don't think that the average person is quite aware of how powerful moving water is. The cubic yard of water weighs about 1,700 pounds, and it's almost incompressible. You might just as well be hit almost with a solid object as to have this water smashing against the structure on the beach. 25 people threw a party in Camille's honor at the Richelieu apartment complex in Pass Christian, Mississippi. Mary Ann Gerlach was one of two survivors. The water, it was almost up to the second floor. At about that time, the water came in, in the back and busted out the back windows. And I swam out and I floated a little while and as I was looking back where the building was, you could see the apartment where the, the hurricane party was going on. They had the hurricane lamps and all of a sudden, the building just started coming down till it came underneath the water and I knew everybody had drowned. Nine out of 10 people who die in hurricanes are killed by storm surge. In 1969, forecasters were just beginning to use mathematical models to help predict storm surge levels. Today, Camille's record surge could have been more accurately predicted by SLOSH, a sophisticated computer model. The areas in red are more than 20 feet underwater. The SLOSH model is a mathematical model. There's math and physics in the model that describe how the wind acts upon the water and how it pushes the water up against the shoreline. We're determining what the storm surge floodplain is uh, before a hurricane comes in the area, and for very powerful storms, we can determine who's at risk and have plans to go ahead and uh, evacuate them. And the total number of deaths due to drowning uh, in hurricanes is being reduced significantly. When Hurricane Hugo struck the coast of South Carolina in 1989, Slosh's prediction was accurate to within one foot. The height of the storm surge flooded the tiny coastal town of McClellanville, north of Charleston. On the barrier islands, the surge broke houses apart Two years after Hugo, island residents are rebuilding to new housing standards. You strap this whole house together from the peak down to the foundation using strips of metal to tie every individual rafter, every member of the roof to the wall. In effect, what it does is if the house is going to fail, it tries to hold it together and not let chunks of it uh, float around and create uh, more and more damage. 
Solomon's Island is only one of 295 barrier islands dotting the shoreline from Texas to Maine. When a hurricane hits, these islands absorb the full intensity of the storm's leading edge. I think a lot of people, when they buy property on the beach, don't understand what might possibly happen to that property. Given a long enough period of time, there will be very few places on the beach, especially uh, along the Gulf Coast, and along the southeast coast of the United States, that won't eventually be affected by a hurricane. As a hurricane approaches your area, the weather conditions may deteriorate rapidly. Have all of your supplies on hand long before the storm actually hits. Once the hurricane begins, stay indoors. The following safety tips may help ensure you and your family's safety. Stay away from windows to avoid flying glass and debris. Do not open windows on the opposite side from the storm. If the electricity goes off, use a flashlight, not candle or kerosene lamps. The risk of fire is too great. Remain indoors. If the eye should pass over your area, the wind and rain will stop, but the storm will pick up again once the eye has passed. After the storm has ended, the danger is not over. Call the police or utility company to report any downed power lines or broken gas lines. Stay away from all of these downed lines. Continue to use your pre-stored water for drinking and cooking until local public health officials have determined the safety of your water supply. And remember, be patient. It may take days or even weeks to clear roads and restore utilities in your area. The Keys, a finger of islands connected by one thin highway from the tip of Florida to Key West. The population in paradise is growing steadily and it explodes every tourist season. Millionaire Henry J. Flagler, in search of a port of trade with Cuba, was the first man to bridge the way through the Keys. In 1904, he ordered his men to go to Key West. Eight years later, he was riding on the railroad they built. Flagler was no stranger to Florida. His East Coast Railway opened the state to expansion. The Overseas Railroad would complete the enterprise. Workers connected 29 islands with bridges. They laid 156 miles of track. To keep on schedule, construction continued through the heart of the hurricane season. 130 men died in the first hurricane. Two more storms were to follow. $27 million later, the storms were a distant memory. That day in 1912, Flagler stepped off his train in Key West to a hero's welcome. It was a celebration of prosperity and the promise of growth. On Labor Day 1935, a hurricane destroyed the Overseas Railroad. Henry J. Flagler had been dead for 22 years. I don't think that they knew, or I'm sure they did not know, that a hurricane could be as powerful as the 1935 hurricane was, which finally ended that railroad. That storm was one of two Category 5 hurricanes that we know of that ever hit the United States, the other one having been Hurricane Camille. The 1935 Labor Day hurricane was a little bit stronger we had been through many, many hurricanes here before, never had a disaster like this, so we were going to ride it out. So after daylight, 
as you walked along and as you looked around, you saw a body here and a body there, you know. This is your family that you're looking at. And um, this is pretty hard. My family was the first family here on the island. They got a land grant from the president back in 1860, 1854. We had 61 in the Russell family. That was uncles, aunts, grandmothers, and cousins and all. And the next morning we had 11 left, which meant that we lost 50 out of our family that one night. Over 500 perished in the storm. The Flagler Railroad was never rebuilt. The train tracks have been replaced with pavement. Today, US-1 will be the only evacuation route when the next hurricane comes. If we lose large numbers of people, it's my belief we're gonna lose them in the cars, on the roads, car in front of them, car in back of them, nowhere to go when the water rises. That happened in the 35 storm, even in the old cars that were there, which were trapped, as, as well as the railroad. Evacuation is not just a problem for remote areas, but threatens all urban coastal cities. As the coastal population grows, more and more people cannot leave when a hurricane threatens. Nowhere is the problem more evident than in New York and New England. Long Island stretches 120 miles from the city of New York out to Montauk Point. Evacuation is a problem because there's no way across Long Island Sound. There are two ferry services across Long Island Sound. Both of them will be out of business at least 12, 6 to 12 hours before the storm hits because of the surge. Okay. So you can't evacuate by water. The only alternative is the two or three bridges in New York City, which people can't get over during a rush hour, more or less in, in an evacuation. The coastal residents of New York and New England probably give little thought to the threat of hurricanes. It was not much different in September of 1938. Most people on the beach didn't even know a storm was coming. The 1938 hurricane started far to sea and then it began to turn toward the north. By the time it got up to Cape Hatteras or just south of there, it had actually begun to veer off a little bit to the northeast. But just about the time that the center of the hurricane got a beam of Hatteras, got due east of there, then it kind of came back a little bit to, toward the west and moved straight north into New England. And it moved very rapidly. At about 7 in the morning, it was due east of Cape Hatteras. By 2.30 in the afternoon, the eye of the hurricane had crossed Long Island. The storm didn't stop there. At Providence, Rhode Island, uh, warning really didn't come out until 4.30 p.m. And by 5 o'clock, uh, water was rising in Exchange Place in downtown Providence, and people were being swept, uh, swept to the desk there. So no one was forecasting this storm to move directly over Long Island and into New England. People just did not realize what they were walking into as they were leaving work. Over 600 people died in the storm. Property damage reached $400 million. Already saturated by heavy rains, rivers ran in torrents. Towns previously spared now suffered from the rains of the great storm. New England's landscape was changed forever. Remember, most of the damage in the 38 hurricane was in Rhode Island because there was nothing on Long Island to damage at that time. The next time this happens, it's gonna hit a highly urbanized Long Island coast before it does its job on New England. It is coming in as a very, very strong hurricane. Make no mistake about it. On August 19th, 1991, Hurricane Bob bore down on New England. Most of Long Island is going to be west of the eye, except maybe the extreme eastern tip, but not so in Buzzards Bay and Narragansett Bay, and even on up toward Boston and Cape Cod, they're going to get raked very, very heavily with this hurricane. The storm's eye passed to the east of Long Island. Once more, New England suffered a majority of the losses. The 
next time, Long Island may not be so lucky. We're long overdue for a strong Category 2 hurricane and probably a 3. And when it comes, it's going to be a disaster that's going to eclipse what we saw with Hurricane Hugo in South Carolina. It's a very controversial point on whether or not we're developing intelligently on the coast. We are putting people at a great deal of risk by wanting to have houses right on the beach. We cannot solve the problem with the science of meteorology. We must deal with the issues of how we develop our barrier islands and our coastal communities. Anybody who lives on the coast has to stay prepared for their family's sake. Don't wait till the last minute and get trapped. In interviews after the hurricane, we asked why people didn't leave. It was because they thought they knew what a hurricane could do, but they didn't.